Everybody knows, in a general way, that the finest place in the world is, or alas, was, the Dutch borough of van der Wattimetis. Yet, as it lies some distance from any of the main roads, being in a somewhat out-of-the-way situation, there are perhaps very few of my readers who have ever paid it a visit. For the benefit of those who have not, therefore, it will be only proper that I should enter into some account of it. And this is, indeed, the more necessary, as with the hope of enlisting public sympathy in behalf of the inhabitants, I design here to give a history of the calamitous events which have so lately occurred within its limits. No one who knows me will doubt that the duty thus self-imposed will be executed to the best of my ability, with all that rigid impartiality, all that cautious examination into facts and diligent collation of authorities, which should ever distinguish him who aspires to the title of historian. By the united aid of medals, manuscripts, and inscriptions, I am enabled to say, positively, that the borough of van der Wattimetis has existed from its origin in precisely the same condition which it at present preserves. At the date of this origin, however, I grieve that I can only speak with the species of indefinite definiteness which mathematicians are, at times, forced to put up with in certain algebraic formulae. The date, I may thus say, in regard to the remoteness of its antiquity, cannot be less than any assignable quantity whatsoever. Touching the derivation of the name von der Wattimetis, I confess myself, with sorrow, equally at fault. Among a multitude of opinions upon this delicate point, some acute, some learned, some sufficiently the reverse, I am able to select nothing which ought to be considered satisfactory. Perhaps the idea of Grogsvik, nearly coincident with that of Krauteplenty, is to be cautiously preferred. It runs, Fonder Vatimitis, Fonder Legedonder, Vatimitis, Quasi und Bleitseis, Bleitseis Absol pro Blitzen. This derivation, to say the truth, is still countenanced by some traces of the electric fluid evident on the summit of the steeple of the house of the town council. I do not choose, however, to commit myself on a theme of such importance, and must refer the reader desirous of information to the Orata Unculae de Ribus Praetor Veterius of Dunderguts. See also Blunderbuzzard, De Derivationibus, pages 27 to 5010, folio, Gothic edition, red and black character, catchword and no cipher, wherein consult also marginal notes in the autograph of Stuff and Puff and with the sub-commentaries of Grunt and Guzzle. Notwithstanding the obscurity which thus envelops the date of the foundation of Fondervatimitis and the derivation of its name, there can be no doubt, as I said before, that it has always existed as we find it at this epoch. The oldest man in the borough can remember not the slightest difference in the appearance of any portion of it, and indeed the very suggestion of such a possibility is considered an insult. The site of the village is in a perfectly circular valley, about a quarter mile in circumference, and entirely surrounded by gentle hills, over whose summit the people have never yet ventured to pass. For this they assign the very good reason that they do not believe there is anything at all on the other side. Round at the skirts of the valley, which is quite level and paved thoroughly with flat tiles, extends a continuous row of sixty little houses. These, having their backs on the hill, must look, of course, to the centre of the plain, which is just sixty yards from the front door of each dwelling. Every house has a small garden before it, with a circular path, a sundial, and twenty-four cabbages. The buildings themselves are so precisely alike that one can in no manner be distinguished from the other. Owing to the vast antiquity, the style of architecture is somewhat odd, but it is not for that reason the less strikingly picturesque. They are fashioned in hard-burned little red bricks, with black ends, so that the walls look like a chessboard upon a great scale. The gables are turned to the front, and there are cornices as big as all the rest of the house over the eaves and over the main doors. The windows are narrow and deep, with very tiny panes and a great deal of sash. On the roof is a vast quantity of tiles with long curly ears. The woodwork throughout is of a dark hue, and there is much carving about it, with but a trifling variety of pattern, for, time out of mind, the carvers of Hunder Vatimetes have never been able to carve more than two objects, a timepiece and a cabbage. But these they do exceedingly well, 
and intersperse them with singular ingenuity wherever they find room for the chisel. The dwellings are as much alike inside as out, and the furniture is all upon one plan. The floors are of square tiles, the chairs and tables of black-looking wood with thin crooked legs and puppy feet. The mantelpieces are wide and high, and have not only timepieces and cabbages sculpted over the front, but a real timepiece, which makes a prodigious ticking, on the top and the middle, with a flower pot containing a cabbage standing on each extremity by way of outrider. Between each cabbage and the timepiece, again, is a little Chinaman, having a large stomach with a great round hole in it, through which is seen the dial plate of a watch. The fireplaces are large and deep, with fierce, crooked-looking fire dogs. There is constantly a rousing fire and a huge pot over it, full of sauerkraut and pork, to which the good woman of the house is always busy in attending. She's a little fat old lady with blue eyes and a red face and wears a huge cap like a sugar loaf, ornamented with purple and yellow ribbons. The dress is of orange-colored linsey woolsey made very full behind and very short in the waist, and indeed very short in other respects, not reaching below the middle of her leg. This is somewhat thick, and so are her ankles, but she has a fine pair of green stockings to cover them. Her shoes, of pink leather, are fastened each with a bunch of yellow ribbons puckered up in the shape of a cabbage. In her left hand, she has a heavy little Dutch watch. In her right hand, she wields a ladle for the sauerkraut and pork. By her side, there stands a fat tabby cat with a gilt toy repeater tied to its tail, which the boys have there fastened by way of a quiz. The boys themselves are, all three of them, in the garden attending the pig. They are each two feet in height. They have three-cornered cocked hats, purple waistcoats reaching down to their thighs, buckskin knee breeches, red woolen stockings, heavy shoes with big silver buckles, and long surtout coats with large buttons of mother of pearl. Each two has a pipe in his mouth and a little dumpy watch in his right hand. He takes a puff and a look, and then a look and a puff. The pig, which is corpulent and lazy, is occupied now in picking up the stray leaves that fall from the cabbages, and now in giving a kick behind at the gilt repeater, which the urchins have also tied to his tail, in order to make him look as handsome as the cat. Right at the front door, in a high-backed, leather-bottomed armchair, with crooked legs and puppy feet like the tables, is seated the old man of the house himself. He is an exceedingly puffy little old gentleman, with big circular eyes and a huge double chin. His dress resembles that of the boys, and I need say nothing further about it. All the difference is that his pipe is somewhat bigger than theirs, and he can make a greater smoke. Like them, he has a watch, but he carries his watch in his pocket. To say the truth, he has something of more importance than a watch to attend to, and what that is I shall presently explain. He sits with his right leg upon his left knee, wears a grave countenance, and always keeps one of his eyes, at least, resolutely bent upon a certain remarkable object in the center of the plain. The object is situated in the steeple of the house of the town council. The town council are all very little, round, oily, intelligent men with big saucer eyes and fat double chins, and have their coats much longer and their shoe buckles much bigger than the ordinary inhabits of Fondervatimitis. Since my sojourn in the borough, they have had several special meetings and have adopted these three important resolutions. That it is wrong to alter the good old course of things, that there is nothing tolerable out of Fondervatimitis, and that we will stick by our clocks and our cabbages. Above the session room of the council is a steeple, and in the steeple is the belfry, where exists, and has existed time out of mind, the pride and wonder of the village, the great clock of the borough of Fondervatimitis. And this is the object to which the eyes of the old gentlemen are turned, who sit in their leather-bottomed armchairs. The great clock has seven faces, one in each of the seven sides of the steeple, so that it can be readily seen from all quarters. Its faces are large and white, and its hands heavy and black. There is a belfry man, whose sole duty it is to attend to it, but this duty is the most perfect of sinecures, for the clock of Fondervatimitis was never yet known to have anything the matter with it. Until lately, the bare supposition of such a thing was considered heretical. From the remotest period of antiquity to which the archives have reference, the hours have been regularly struck by the big bell. 
and indeed the case was just the same with all the other clocks and watches in the borough. Never was such a place for keeping the true time. When the large clapper thought proper to say twelve o'clock, all its obedient followers opened their throats simultaneously and responded like a very echo. In short, the good burghers were fond of their sauerkraut, but then they were proud of their clocks. All people who hold sinecure offices are held in more or less respect, and as the belfry man of Fondervatimites has the most perfect of sinecures, he is the most perfectly respected of any man in the world. He is the chief dignitary of the borough, and the very pigs look up to him with a sentiment of reverence. His coattail is very far longer, his pipe, his shoe buckles, his eyes, and his stomach very far bigger than those of any other old gentleman in the village, and as to his chin, it is not only double, but triple. I have thus painted the happy estate of Thunder what time it is. Alas, that so fair a picture should ever experience a reverse. There has been long a saying among the wisest inhabitants that no good can come from over the hills, and it really seemed that the words had in them something of the spirit of prophecy. It wanted five minutes of noon on the day before yesterday when there appeared a very odd-looking object on the summit of the ridge to the eastward. Such an occurrence, of course, attracted universal attention, and every little old gentleman who sat in a leather-bottomed armchair turned one of his eyes with a stare of dismay upon the phenomenon, still keeping the other upon the clock in the steeple. By the time that it wanted only three minutes to noon, the droll object in question was perceived to be a very diminutive foreign-looking man. He descended the hills at a great rate so that everybody had soon a good look at him. He was really the most finicky little personage that had ever been seen in Fondervatimites. His countenance was of a dark snuff color, and he had a long hooked nose, pea eyes, a wide mouth, and an excellent set of teeth, which latter he seemed anxious of displaying, as he was grinning from ear to ear. What with mustachios and whiskers, there was none of the rest of his face to be seen. His head was uncovered, and his hair neatly done up in papelotes. His dress was a tight-fitting, swallow-tailed black coat, from one of whose pockets dangled a vast length of white handkerchief, black kerzimir knee breeches, black stockings, and stumpy-looking pumps, with huge bunches of black satin ribbon for bows. Under one arm he carried a huge chapeau de bras, and under the other a fiddle nearly five times as big as himself. In his left hand was a gold snuff-box, from which, as he capered down the hill, cutting all manner of fantastic steps, he took snuff incessantly with an air of the greatest possible self-satisfaction. God bless me! Here was a sight for the honest burghers of Fondervatimites. To speak plainly, the fellow had, in spite of his grinning, an audacious and sinister kind of face, and as he crevetted right into the village, the old stumpy appearance of his pumps excited no little suspicion, and many a burgher who beheld him that day would have given a trifle for a peep beneath the white cambric handkerchief which hung so obtrusively from the right pocket of his swallow-tailed coat. But what mainly occasioned a righteous indignation was that the scoundrelly popinjay, while he cut a fandango here and a whirligig there, did not seem to have the remotest idea in the world of such a thing as keeping time in his steps. The good people of the borough had scarcely a chance, however, to get their eyes thoroughly open, when, just as it wanted half a minute of noon, the rascal bounded, as I say, right into the midst of them, gave a chasse here, a balancé there, and then, after a pirouette and a pas de zephyr, pigeon-winged himself right up into the belfry of the house of the town council, where the wonder-stricken belfry man sat smoking in a state of dignity and dismay. But the little chap seized him at once by the nose, gave it a swing and a pull, clapped the big chapeau de bras upon his head, knocked it down over his eyes and mouth, and then, lifting up the big fiddle, beat him with it so long and so soundly that what with the belfry man being so fat and the fiddle being so hollow, you would have sworn that there was a regiment of double bass drummers all beating the devil's tattoo up in the belfry of the steeple of Fondervatimites. There is no knowing to what desperate act of vengeance this unprincipled attack might have aroused the inhabitants, but for the important fact that it now wanted only half a second of noon. The bell was about to strike, and it was a matter of absolute and preeminent necessity that everybody should look well at his watch. It was evident, however, that just at this moment, 
the fellow in the steeple was doing something that he had no business to do with the clock. But as it now began to strike, nobody had any time to attend his maneuvers, for they had all to count the strokes of the bell as it sounded. One, said the clock. Von, echoed every little old gentleman in every leather-bottomed armchair in von der Wattheimites. Von, said also his watch. Von, said the watch of his vrouw. And von, said the watches of the boys, and the little gilt repeaters on the tails of the cat and pig. Two, continued the big bell. And do, repeated all of the repeaters. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, said the bell. Three, four, feba, Sax, sieben, eight, nine, ten, answered the others. Eleven, said the big one. Eleven, assented the little ones. Twelve, said the bell. Twelve, they replied, briefly satisfied and dropping their voices. Und twelve it is, said all the little gentlemen, putting up their watches, but the big bell had not done with them yet. Thirteen, said he. Der Teufel, gasped the little old gentleman, turning pale, dropping their pipes, and putting down their right legs over their knees. Der Teufel, they groaned. Thirteen, thirteen. Mein Gott, it is thirteen o'clock. Why attempt to describe the terrible scene which ensued? All hundred of time it is flew at once into a lamentable state of uproar. What is come to my belly? roared all the boys. I have been hungry for this hour. What is come to my kraut? screamed all the vrouws. It has been done to rags for this hour. What is come to my pipe? swore all the little old gentlemen. Donder and blitzen. It has been smoked out for this hour and they filled them up again in a great rage, and, sinking back in their armchairs, puffed away so fast and so fiercely that the whole valley was immediately filled with impenetrable smoke. Meantime, the cabbages all turned very red in the face, and it seemed as if old Nick himself had taken possession of everything in the shape of a timepiece. The clocks carved upon the furniture took to dancing as if bewitched while those upon the mantelpieces could scarcely contain themselves for fury, and kept such a continual striking of thirteen, and such a frisking and wriggling of their pendulums, as was really horrible to see. But worse than all, neither the cats nor the pigs could put up any longer with the behavior of the little repeaters tied to their tails, and resented it by scampering all over the place, scratching and poking and squeaking and screeching and caterwauling and squalling, and flying into the faces and running under the petticoats of the people, and creating altogether the most abominable din and confusion which it is possible for a reasonable person to conceive. And to make matters still more distressing, the rascally little scapegrace in the steeple was evidently exerting himself to the utmost. Every now and then one might catch a glimpse of the scoundrel through the smoke. There he sat in the belfry upon the belfryman, who was lying flat on his back, in his teeth, the villain held the bell rope, which he kept jerking about with his head, raising such a clatter that my ears ring again even to think of it. On his lap lay the big fiddle, at which he was scraping, out of all time and tune, with both hands, making a great show, the nincompoop, of playing Judy O'Flanagan and Patty O'Rafferty. Affairs being thus miserably situated, I left the place in disgust, and now appeal for aid to all lovers of correct time and fine kraut. Let us proceed in a body to the borough and restore the ancient order of things to Fondervatimites by ejecting that little fellow from the steeple.